My name is R. Crosby Lyles, and this is news from the can. Carbon X Prize. $100 million for a gigaton scale CO2 capture, and that's from Elon Musk. Okay, so let me hit the bullets here. One, carbon capture will have to be done at, at between 500 hectopascals or 18,000 ish feet and 50 hectopascals or about 64,000 ish feet because CO2 is persistent and building in those two places. Um, the source appears to be methane from various points, not limited to Arctic permafrost, oil and gas exploration, and infrastructure, and agriculture, not limited to Indian and Chinese rice production. Our belief is that use of amine, this is important. Three, our belief is that the use of amine liquids like monoethanolamine, or MEA, it's used on submarines for scrubbing CO2 out of the air, and other uses, um, distributed by aircraft in droplet form, distributed by air, aircraft at altitude, should be thoroughly evaluated before attempted on a wide scale. That's basically my idea. And that's for use in the stratosphere because it's, it's not mobile. It's in the rarefied air of the stratosphere, the air is very dry. So it's not going anywhere. It's not getting washed out. It's not forming cloud droplets. It's kind of stuck there, and that's at the 50 hectopascal level, about 64,000 feet. And this is though methods like this may be the only way to mitigate CO2 accumulation in what appears to be a methane pulse scenario, which is what it looks like we have. The knock-on effects of employing such a gas might be worse. Might be worse. You know, methanolamine, um, you know, what's that... By the time it hits the ground from 64,000 feet, after you've sprayed it out of an aircraft, and how much would you need? Uh, you know, do you need gigatons of that? Um, it's hard to say. You got to do a little bit of math there on that. It looks like it's about a thousand parts per million uh, in the stratosphere, which in that rarefied air um, is actually a lower concentration. Oh, it's, well, the concentration is a thousand parts per million. But the millions are spread out because it's at a lower pressure. So lower pressure means less particles. Um, so some calculations have to be done on that tip, but it's a wide area. You know, it's a very wide area, a broadband of CO2 around the, the, the stratosphere, around the equator. Most importantly, these events might not be the end of the world as we know it. Might not be the end of the world as we know it. According to Richard P. Wayne from Chemistry of Atmospheres, first edition, 1985, post-atmospheric nuclear test ban isotopic data pegged the half-life of CO2 at seven years in the atmosphere. Important because this fact was published well before the piss fight over global warming began in earnest and because it reassures us that this CO2 won't stay up there forever. However, transport in the stratosphere is a complicated subject, open to debate. The maximum concentration of CO2 may not be reached at altitude for years, and the subsequent depletion may take decades. This is, not, um, this is especially true for the dry air at the 50 hectopascal level. The lower 500 hectopascal level, which is about 18,000 feet, is subject to rain out as clouds and weather permeate this region. And you can see it, you know, you can see striations cut through the, through the arrangement. Five, occultation from trees, that's like being, that's like something being between you and something that blocks your view. Um, and that's like, that's a deep science. And this was why the, the Copernicus satellite monitoring system is so incredible. That they that they're able to actually do this kind of imaging at these you know uh, small trace amounts of gases, occultation from trees and other obstructions may hide exactly how much CO2 is coming from melting permafrost. Dr. Charles Miller stated on a video several years ago, and he's from he's from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's a heavy he's a heavyweight dude, um, and he appears in some. I'm gonna say this. He appears in some RT, some Russian television videos, because they, like, do the global warming thing. 
uh, because it's a wedge issue in America and so, and so forth. But he's, you know, he's a real guy. He's with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and, and this is years ago now that this that I actually saw this interview, uh, maybe 2012, 2013, somewhere near, maybe earlier. Dr. Charles Miller stated on a video several years ago that warm temperatures had been transported to depths of many tens of meters. So we're talking like 50 meters, something like that, under the ground, under the permafrost in the Arctic. And what this suggests is that an underground self-sustaining heat-induced microbial consumption of biological material feedback may have been going on since as far back as 2012, maybe sooner, or maybe maybe earlier than that. If so, the horse may have left the proverbial barn on climate change. You know, just because you can't see the point source, you don't see the red concentration coming from a particular point, doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, that it's not bubbling up from a largely distributed area of land or water. So... And what this is saying is that, you know, the Earth is a good is a good insulator. So when you start, when you get some melting, somehow or another, down 50 meters, 150 feet below the, the surface level of the of the ground, and it starts to heat up, and that heat causes uh, anaerobic, which is where your methane comes from, causes anaerobic consumption of the organic material down there which also produces heat it's like a self-sustaining feedback loop the heat from the microbial action melts more permafrost which allows more material to be consumed which produces more heat which allows more stuff to be consumed and it's a feedback loop underground that you can't see and you don't know how widespread it is until the ground actually collapses which is where you see the pingos and things like that where there's a raised area and it will blow up and and that's been going on for a minute, um, for probably, you know, really decades. But, um, you know, it's one of those kind of things where it's an exponential, if it's an exponential growth in that kind of, you know, if there are above ground feedbacks that feed underground feedbacks that they feed each other. And the only thing that's going to stop that is if it gets, if it, if, and this is what I'm hoping, is that uh, it, it gets really super cold and freezes that ground back down to depth, you know, reaches many sub, uh, you know, uh, 60 degrees below or something like that and freezes that ground way down deep again, then it would stop it. And I believe that those temperatures also will cause the CO2 to, to, to rain out, will we'll cause it to to uh, sublimate into snow, you know, become attached to snow, rain, stuff like that. Because CO2 is a compressible gas. It's very highly compressible. You know, it's subject to being, you know, to having a dew point. And that dew point is, you know, probably, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's like negatives, you know, 20, 30, 40 degrees C, somewhere in there. <laughs> and you can get dry ice at the supermarket, you know. I mean, just you can see how it is. Uh, six reliable atmospheric temperature data suggest that global temperatures may not be getting consistently hotter, but simply more erratic with higher highs and lower lows. And stronger winds and per, uh, precipitation is stated by trusted experts for decades now. They've been talking about it for years. The regime of cooling equator and heating Arctic have caused the polar vortex to break down repeatedly. We've seen it happen repeatedly, bringing apocalyptic apocalyptic amounts of precipitation you know I've mentioned this many times six feet of rain you know in Houston and I think uh, even um, where the Kilauea volcano is there was a, a hurricane that, that ended up over there and it dropped you know six feet of rain in 24 36 hours less than 36 hours 24 hours something like that was you know a lot of rain same thing happened in South, uh, South and North Carolinas. So, you know, that's the thing that that regime of extreme temperature differentials, extreme temperature differentials drive high winds and heavy precipitation. And you know, the advent of of a warm ocean, warm sea surface temperatures, and uh, the lower uh, 
heat capacity of the land surface. You know, when the sun fades for the winter time, that land, those land temperatures drop like a rock. You know, they they drop like a rock, and then you have that the warm sea surface temperatures are producing all this moisture, and that's just a recipe for a lot of snow and rain and and all that. Seven. Ultimately, if the Earth is not going to turn into Venus, which I don't believe it is, but, you know, uh, I don't believe it is, uh, <laughs> but it could get funky. Um, we may have time to wait and see how the situation develops. Rushing into rash solutions might make the situation worth, like using, uh, and it may not even be practical to use something like uh, monoethylamine, distributed by aircraft, you know, sprayed out of an aircraft at 50 hectopascals to take the CO2 out if that's really needed. But that's at the, you know, that that one, uh, that um, thousand parts per million that's distributed around the equator, you know, those temperatures around the equator, those surface temperatures around the equator, uh, the two meter temperature, is not really like out of control. It's actually cooler. So, you know, this may change. You know, uh, the mechanics of this stuff um, is really should be discussed by you know the by the heavy hitters out there. I bring up L Richard Lenzen a lot, which he's has been called a you know a global warming uh, skeptic, and I guess he is. I don't know how he's doing. You know, he's getting up there in age. Um, there are other people you know really you know qualified people that need to that need to be discussing this openly or w with whomever and certainly Joe Biden and Kamala Harris y'all need to be looking at this shit y'all need to have I, they probably already are but in case they're not yeah you need to get the heavy hitters in there to talk about this to to see what's gonna you know to to crunch the numbers and put the models together the computer models and see what's up see how this thing's gonna go down because it's there, you know. It's there. It's going to go down. But I, 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 what I try to impress upon people is don't freak out. Don't freak out because we don't really know how it's going to go down. We need to do something about it um, and certainly need to curtail our, our use of fossil fuels. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm a big proponent of small nuclear power just because it's the most logical thing. It's zero you know, zero emissions. Um, quick side note for all you guys, young, young, young cats and kittens out there. Uh, small nuclear with with a regime of small nuclear power stations um, around that are that are made and that are built in robust conditions. You know, they can be made so that they can survive virtually any catastrophe, uh, you know, catastrophic <laughs> wind, rain, earthquake, tidal wave, you know what I mean? They can make small nuclear reactors that can withstand virtually anything, which means that you can watch the apocalypse on TV while you're eating a Hot Pocket or playing a video game. You know what I'm saying? Pretty much. You know, we're all always talking about, you know, being able to move to another planet like Mars or something like that in case the shit hits the fan. No, you don't really have to go through all that because, you know, if you have if you have buildings that are made properly, um, you can even have buildings that are that have um, atmospheric, you know, controlled atmospheric conditions inside of them. You know what I'm saying? You can have oxygen controlled bubbles that people live in that are that that the power is maintained the oxygen levels are maintained and and, and in essence basically humanity could suffer could could survive a permian triassic level event with small nuclear power you know that's you know that's uh, the that they're able to scram you know that they're able to shut down quickly if they need to or whatever and that are just super well contained small nuclear reactors have been used on submarines for over a half a century safely i mean they've had and if you've ever seen the small confines of a submarine and the, the fucking reactors right there bro i mean 
and they've had people many hundreds of people thousands of people that have worked on these submarines for months and months and months and months and years at a time right next to a re you know to a reactor that's generating 50 megawatts or some shit like this you can run a pretty good sized neighborhood on 50 megawatts you know what i'm saying so it's totally doable yeah it's just totally doable i mean we could bas basically have a, a planet where we could have the genetic material of of every species on earth um safely tucked away in a facility you know a stable facility somewhere uh, underground above ground whatever in buildings that are built to withstand nuclear war nuclear war nuclear winter whatever yeah, um, meteor strike you know whatever really um, and 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 powered by small nuclear reactors that filter the water and filter the air and do all that stuff and you know you basically have one two several you know um, basically uh, planet earth arc type of things you know they have a seed vault <laughs> got flooded you know which isn't funny but you know if you get a small nuclear reactor then you can run a freezer like forever and the energy density of uranium and other stuff is so high that you, it doesn't have to be that efficient it doesn't have to be you know the chernobyl thing they you know that went down like that because they were trying to like milk every ounce of energy that they could milk out of that uranium plutonium whatever the hell they were using you know and screwing around testing the facility running it out of you know uh that that's a whole night like digression there but you know you don't have to have a the most efficient it doesn't have to be the most efficient reactor in the, in the universe you're only trying to boil water you know what i mean you can you know reactors can get white hot you don't have to it doesn't have to be that hot they can be hot enough to boil water you know a pebble bed reactor or whatever and they can be made safely they can be made safe and robust to to like basically run maintenance free maybe for for at least decades you know so it's a no-brainer i mean if you're gonna like put humanity in a cradle somewhere with half the other species on earth you know what i'm saying because some apocalyptic shit went down you know you're really gonna I mean, you're gonna take if you're gonna if you're gonna take people to mars and try to live on a planet where the air is as thin as it is at forty thousand feet you know what i'm saying and the the soil has uh perchlorate in it and shit like that you know and you and and you're gonna basically kill yourself trying to get there because we don't have you know artificial gravity systems and shit like that and all the you know it's ridiculous if you're going to go through all that you can easily you can easily uh do um create a uh you can e easily build a logan's run type of thing which is kind of scary that's a scary movie but the movie was really a it was a it was commentary on uh hollywood's obsession with youth is really what that movie was about but anyway so eight one of the best ways the best we may be able to do now is begin to cap the millions of uncapped oil wells in the lower 48 contiguous United States and elsewhere to stop the natural gas from leaking from so many locations. Some kind of burn-off system might be deployable on towers, etc., to keep gas from escaping to the stratosphere. Because once in the stratosphere, CO2 will stay up there until the natural transport carries it back to Earth. Because it's not, it's dry up there. It's just 50 hectopascals is not going to take it away. Uh, and, you know, this is according to Vice, you know, there are, you know, uh, the video link is in the description. I put it in several videos. It's like, um, you know, they're really, you know, they're really trying to keep this stuff from, from getting out there, which I'm not really promoting it because um, you don't really know how people are going to react to to seeing this. Um, I don't really necessarily, I would not want people to freak out. It's time to do something, but, you know, it's not time to, you know, I don't think it's really, I don't really think it's a good time for despair. 
um, or anything like that uh, because we really don't know what's going to happen next. But we're going to need to, like, you know, it's going to need to be discussed. Um, and it's not, certainly shouldn't be ignored, you know. This is, you know, well, you know, you, you get it. Anyway, nine SMR small nuclear reactors seem to be the safest net zero way forward for large scale power production. Used on the small kind f confines of, of submarines for over half a century, small nuclear reactors have been used safely with not that many known incidents from trusted American manufacturers like GE Westinghouse and many, many, many more. There are many, many, many small nuclear reactor because they're not that fucking hard to build you know it's like they know how to build them they know how to build reactors that are safe and reliable and will last for years you know what I mean they do they've been doing it forever Westinghouse GE and uh, there's a few others I can't remember their names right offhand I'm not trying to ignore them oh and for sure you know Newscale their 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 safety uh, margin is at the plant boundary, the court to hear them tell it. They're like they don't have the you know the ten mile radius thing. It's right there at the plant boundary, because according to them, they're they're uh, they got a three hundred megawatt. They, I don't know what all they have, but one the one that I'm familiar with is like sixty feet tall. It's like a cylindrical kind of thing. It's made in a factory. They deliver it. They hook it up, plug it in. It's three hundred megawatts. For each one of those units so three of those will get you a gig right and um, but the bottom line is they've had small nuclear reactors on submarines for, since the 50s so we're talking about 70 years dude 70 years of nuclear submarines a nuclear system a nuclear reactor right behind a motherfucker you know what I mean where you're you know you're in a confined bubble underwater for six months at a time with a nuclear a nuclear reactor right next to you you've been eating shit sh eating sleeping shit and pissing you know what i mean breathing the, the the rarefied air in there you know what i'm saying so i don't know what the, i haven't seen any data on that it might be a good thing to look at you know what the data is on people who have been on submarines for long periods of time but yeah i haven't seen anything about it uh, the soviets uh have famously blown up a c several nuclear frigates and some submarines uh, I like it more than one you know had some meltdown in the in the Arctic um, but you know that's the that's that's the Russians and they just love to break shit I mean like you know you want to talk about they're like the fucking poster child of radiological disaster <laughs> it's like they just you know they just gotta break shit <laughs> sorry you know Talk about they're just they're just they're just savages. <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to radiological shit, the Russians are just savages. They're just such savages. I'm being funny, but it's true. Okay, so let me see. The bottom line is, if we want to survive Armageddon. We will need lots of small nuclear reactors plugged into existing uh, grid wherever needed. You can just plug the fucking thing in, pretty much. Depending on how it's made, you just plug it in. Um, yeah, there's probably some some issues here and there. Where they get into trouble with? Um, let me read this last thing here. Let us hope whatever happens next provides inspiration to enough people for us to move permanently away from fossil fuels. This is written, voiced music, and production by me, Rock Crosby Lyles. Where they get into trouble with nuclear reactors is when you get into the gigawatts of heat. Then all of a sudden you get into this realm where the expansion of the steam is such that you have to have contain your containment vessel has to be ridiculous. And it's just at that level it becomes sort of like they become so hard to make that they're just too expensive. You know. So if you have a small a whole bunch of small nuclear reactors, then the containment facilities are easier to build it's just they're just it's just easier to manage and 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 they're better in a, in a sense because you can turn them on and turn them off you know to match the 
the load because the load varies over the day over a 24 hour period so and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of technical stuff in there um to really break all that down it's it's pretty nerdy but i'm what i'm doing here is the obvious it's this my tone and stuff like that is you know is it's because this shit is obvious to a lot of people I mean, I'm, I'm really just, I'm really just giving you the, the, the obvious stuff. I don't get into a lot of detail because, you know, just on the face of it, it's obvious. Um, you know, from experience, so we already had Fukushima, which was bad. That's bad, but you know, and I, not to minimize anything with that, you know, uh, they have a lot of water, a lot of radioactive water sitting on a hill in tanks but you know they built that they built the place with the backup generators it's like ground level it's like dude why would you do that why wouldn't you put those on the roof or something or at least on a tower or something you know what i mean it's like what's going on with that they weren't so they weren't expecting you know my rule of thumb is you make shit to like withstand 10 times what you never thought it would ever have. You know what I mean? You build stuff so that it's going to withstand just goddamn anything. That's how you have to do nuclear. You have to you have to do it so it's, you know, like it's made for space. So it will withstand anything. And it's doable and affordable, I think. You know? Um, the problem with... The big problem with... Um, as we just seen in Texas, the big problem with solar is that for widespread use, um, this is something Elon Musk has brought up before that, you know, 100 square miles of solar panels. But, you know, man, that's, that's a lot of batteries. And the guy's a battery manufacturer, which the batteries are made out of. You know, it's like you're trading one rape the earth business model for another one because it's like you're digging the coal out of the ground. But with him, it's like you're digging the the, the nickel and the, the graphite. They're, they're really made of nickel and graphite and a little bit of lithium, according to them. So, and, you know, he's coming from a good place on it. You know, this it's a good thing, you know. The electric vehicle paradigm is necessary because most of the emissions come from cars, apparently. A lot of emissions come from cars. So that's a thing. That's a that's a good thing. But you know, power that with nuclear power. Put that together with nuclear power. Put together electric vehicles, electric aircraft, electric cars, electric transport vehicles. You know, uh, battery powered stuff. But put it together with because solar. The problem with solar is, yeah, you're going to need batteries. Those batteries can catch fire. Um, there's a lot of switch gear involved. You know, the, they need maintenance. You got to keep the weeds down. So somebody's got to be out there with a weed whacker, or you know, you got to be spraying that stuff with Roundup or whatever to keep the weeds down. And when it snows, you're out of business, which is what we saw in Texas. A whole bunch of solar panels covered with snow. They're not generating electricity. Now, in Texas, that was a small, you know, a relatively small amount of of juice that they were that they were creating. You know, and there's really no excuse in Texas because they got everything. They've got nuclear and and gas and and coal and everything, and they've got their it's their grid. That's they they are because they don't share power within any neighboring states. They don't have to be regulated by the federal government, and they just did what they they did it how they wanted to do it, and their shit failed. And it has failed before, and they've been warned. You know, Abbott has been, you know, they've, they've been warned. They know about it, and they just didn't do anything about it. And a lot of people suffered from enormous, you know, bills. We probably sure everybody's already seen this already. You know, they have a floating, some sort of, uh, it's a market. It's like an energy market. So if, you know, energy is in more demand or there's some sort of a problem with delivery, then your bill can just, like, become enormous and you need a $16,000, $17,000 electric bill for a month or some shit like that. You know, just some absurd thing. So that's, you know, that's the thing with solar. It's okay as long as there's, you know, nothing bad ever happens. You know, there's no volcanic ash or dust in the air that's going to collect on your solar panels and tear them up. 
you know, because that stuff is corrosive and it's going to block them and stuff and bird shit and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, wind farms, yeah, they're all cool and everything. It's some huge, incredible machinery. You know, GE makes a 12 megawatt wind turbine. And I'm like, wow, 12 megawatts. How much wind does it take to get one of those things to, to turn? And stuff, and they're just fraught with problems. And when they break down, you got to figure out what the hell to do with all that material. And the switch gear, you know, you got to run wire. You got it's like all this infrastructure. You got to make all these roads and shit. Or if it's out in the ocean, you have to have these these seaworthy uh, uh, conductor cables, you know, and shit. And that stuff's not cheap. And you know, it's like, and they kill apex predators and stuff. It's just, you know. So and 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 on that topic, it's something I've been meaning to talk about for a while. So so let's let's do a little just you know a real obvious analysis of this. Uh, well, oh, so it's, let, let's just call it the ten megawatt. You get a GE, the one that came out a couple of years ago, the ten megawatt wind turbine. So in order to get a gig out of that, a gigawatt. You need a hundred of them, and they're big. They're huge. You know, they're as tall as the fucking Eiffel Tower. You know what I mean? So you got to have a hundred Eiffel Tower size tall things to get a gigawatt. Where I think you can get a gigawatt out of three sixty foot, and they're in the ground anyway. But three three new scale reactors. You know did take up the area of probably half a city block if that you know what I mean you know there's an economy of scale there that doesn't really doesn't really wash it's because I don't know that I don't know what it is about it. wind turbines that people are just in love with fucking wind turbines man <laughs> it's because you got to drill into it a little bit they get torn up and when it, you know they they get hit by birds and they get hit by hail and tor you know the the they they lose efficiency because the blades get messed up, and then you got to string some poor son of a bitch, like hundreds of feet above the ground, with a goddamn palm sander in their hand to sand the surface of the blade, you know, and redress it in situ and shit, you know, uh, and they pay ninety dollars an hour, which is great. I mean, it's jobs. Hey, what the hell? But you got to have a hundred of those fucking things. A hundred of them. A hundred Eiffel Tower sized things for one gigawatt of electricity that may not be on all the time. And it's going to be busy killing fucking apex predators while you're at it. It's just like, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You know? I know some, but there are people out there that are making windmills and shit and Gee, seemed like a good idea at the time. But not really, you know? And if there if there's ever a cataclysmic event, if there's ever like a like a meteor strike, like a Permian Triassic type of shit, all those fucking windmills and shit are gonna be toast. They're gonna be fucking toast. Oh, well what about the nuclear reactors? They might, you know. All the nuclear reactors would uh Turn it. We would go Mars. That's something that uh, Guy McPherson here was talking about. Coffee and the end of the world. Uh, when he was in Belize. Quick aside here. Now I saw this coffee and the end of the world in, in Belize uh, when Guy McPherson was living in Belize, right? And uh, <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny. And I'm like, well, I wonder why the hell he's living in Belize. You know what I mean? It's like. He's talking about wet bulb temperatures and stuff like that. I'm thinking he's, he's living closer to the equator. What's up with that? Why is he lives? Why would he want to live closer to the equator? Okay, two years ago, I, I was working to do some tile work here in town, in new construction, and the wet bulb temperatures here. This is in the summer of uh, 2018, like July, and we were getting ready. We we're going to go to Costa Rica to do a Qigong conference in Costa Rica on uh, Montaña Azul up there. Um, and um, 
I had to like quit one day because the wet bulb temperatures were so high that, and it never happened to me before in my life, and Guy McPherson immediately came to mind, all that wet bulb temperature stuff. This is in Gainesville, Florida, so this is, you know, uh, not quite latitude 30, nor 30, you know what I mean? Um, below latitude nor 30. And um, my fan, I had a fan blowing right on me, and it wasn't doing anything. It was spooky. Kind of freaked me out a little bit. I'm thinking about Guy McPherson and, you know, the end of the world and Venus and shit like that. And uh, I'm here sitting there with a fan blowing right on. It's 100, at least 100 degrees inside this house. I got the windows open and stuff. The wind isn't really blowing very much. The humidity, the wet bulb temperature is high. And that fan was not doing shit. It was blowing hot air on me, and I was not sweating. And I was like, damn. So I had to shut down for the day. I went and left, and it rained shortly after that. And when it rained, it cooled everything right down. Because the, that's the transport. The heat transports up to the top of the clouds, and it condenses, and the rain comes back down and transports the cool, you know, it, it's that's the cooling system. Okay, so like a day or two later, we get on a plane and go to Costa Rica. Costa Rica 600 miles from the equator. We get off the plane in San Jose. It's like a fall day in Florida. It's cool. The temperatures are lovely. It's beautiful. And now I'm thinking about Guy McPherson in, in Belize, and I'm like, that's why that dude was living in Belize, because it's nice. <laughs> the temperatures are nice. And so that's when I really started, like, peeling into this a little more and realized that, you know, this thing may not, you know, because you keep talking about how there would be these death zones in the equator, and it's like, it ain't kind of going down like that. Right now, there's a there's a thousand parts per million at the 50 hectopascal level, high up, 64,000 feet, wrapped all the way around the equator, but the temperatures aren't that high. In fact, matter of fact, the sea surface temperatures are cooling off, and they're, they, you know, see people on NCAR, and they're trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. <laughs> it's because... As Richard P. Wayne stated in, in this, as I stated before in his book, Chemistry of Atmospheres, um, greenhouse gas in the stratosphere causes global cooling. And that's a function of statistics because it's closer to space. You hold the blanket in close to you, you, you warm up, you pull it out like that, you know, and you're going to, you're blocking the radiation from coming in and and it's distributing out to space, and it just causes global cooling, which you can see. I'm going to show you that in a second here. I want to play this for a second. This is from a video that I made several years ago. This is May 11, 2017. This guy. There have been changes in the Arctic, in the permafrost, in terms of the temperature over time, not only in the shallow layers near the surface, but at 10, 20, and 50 meter depths, you're seeing changes that are even more rapid. That indicates that not only is there heating near the surface, but that this heat is being transported to depth. Let's go back here for a second. So, Dr. Charles Miller from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, that the heat's being transported to depth. And that's when I was talking about that feedback. And the only thing that's going to stop that is if it gets super cold for a while, which is the, which is my you know the the methane off switch hypothesis <clears throat> that I put forward already. Um, so and he, you know he's a heavy hitter, this guy right here. I mean that's you know no he's no he's no screwing around. All right. Yeah, Dr. Charles Miller. Yeah, he's the real deal. And there's a bunch of, you know, anybody who's at NCAR or any of those other places. Uh, you know, I've, I have some other people on here. There's a woman on here, and, man, I can't remember what her name is. She was great. And she's talking about, you know, where the methane's coming from. They did a, a methane survey a number of years ago, and they found that it's basically coming from between 30 and... 
60 degrees north latitude is where most of the methane comes from. And it comes from wetlands and farming, rice fields, lion's share. Okay, let's see. Um, let me just pop through this real quick. This is the X. He's given away $100 million for somebody who can a measurable impact at a gigaton level. Whatever it takes. Time is of the essence. Well, yeah, pretty much. So, um, you know, I don't know if skeeting out a bunch of MEA is such a good idea. But it's a thought if it's a problem. If it's not, I, you know, we could wait and see how it develops. But this is something that that it's part of the discussion. I started looking at, at coal. You know what's the deal with what's the deal with Sky News in Australia and Rupert Murdoch, you know what I mean? Who runs Fox News and all that kind of stuff? The political desires out there that sort of run the universe is the rape the earth and the cheap labor, cheap labor, cheap materials versus, oh my God, what are we doing to the planet? People who are concerned about what we're doing to the planet. So that's where the that's where the fight is. So I started looking at coal, you know, because my idea was, well, you know, maybe we could just buy up a bunch of coal reserves and make coal expensive enough. Indian uh, delicate face. Yeah, I don't know what happened to my the daunting thing about CO2 and coal, the economics of coal. The top countries are the United States, Russia, Australia, and China, and India for coal. The United States is like the Saudi Arabia of coal. That's 254 billion tons of coal reserves. Russia has 176 billion tons, almost 177 billion. Australia has 159 billion tons of coal. And their economy, you know, it's like 6% of their GDP is, is related to coal. Iron ore, and it's shit you dig out of the ground. They're, so they're, they make their money on raping the earth. Sorry, it's a house and tourism. <laughs> Raping the earth and tourism. It's like iron ore and coal. That's where they, that's their biggest export. And they ex export a lot of that coal to Japan now because I guess they got spooked from Fukushima. But the total is a trillion tons, is 1.1378 trillion tons worldwide. So the United States is 22%. And um, that's a lot of money. Australia's coal will last for 125 years. And here, this is it. Australia's primary energy, energy consumption is dominated by coal, around 40%. Oil, 34%, and gas, 22%. Coal accounts for about 75% of Australia's electricity generation, followed by gas, 16%, hydro, 5%, and wind, around 2%. So wind is really not that much there. But in 2019, Australia exported $64 billion worth of coal. Japan was Australia's largest customer, accounting for 27% of our total coal exports worth $17 billion. So you're talking about $64 billion a year in exports of coal. And that's where all this sky news, you know, right-wing stuff, anti-green, anti-global warming stuff comes from us because they're making, they're getting 64 billion. That's kind of, that's hard to fight against. And the X prize of, you know, a hundred million dollars for a d d demonstrable uh, gigatons worth of carbon sequestration, which, you know, I mean, how much monoethanolamine, MEA, how many tons of that would you need to sequester a gigaton of carbon? <laughs> you know, it'd be a DAS ton. It would be like super expensive. I don't think this stuff is cheap. They use it on submarines. I, I actually got this from Smarter Every Day with Destin from Smarter Every Day. Is he was he's got the submarine series and he did a little piece about how they get the CO2 out of the air. You know, they clean the air in the submarines. I, I like to watch him because this guy, you know, he's he just got such a joy of engineering and science. It's a pleasure to watch, you know. Um, and of course, I get a lot of stuff from Answers with Joe. To, he's he's got a pretty he does a pretty cool thing too. That's where I got the X Prize, 
you know, that's that's who brought it up was Joe from Answers with Joe. I can't remember what his last name is. But that's it. The highest, you know, I just showed you the highest coal reserves in the world. And, you know, that's a lot. 147 billion tons. That's their proven reserves in Australia. They have a gigantic 147 or 147.4 billion tons estimated in 2018 of coal. And I'm sorry, but that's just going to be, they're not going to let go of that easily. And, uh, you know, it's going to take some shit. You know, I'm telling you. <laughs> you know, to get all these countries that are, that are making that much money on coal to let go of it. So here's the, once again, okay, so this is the total column right now, um, Saturday, February 27th. Through February third, they do. This is a, actually a, a forecast. So there's a way that they figure out what this looks like. But one one of the things I want to point out here is that when you look at this total column, it it looks it has a look. It looks as though that the carbon dioxide is just coming is is coming from China. And it's coming from Central Africa and from Colombia, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela area, right? As far as carbon sequestration is concerned and efficacy thereof, this is the European Space Agency. They're not just going to put up something that's false because the design, the purpose of the Copernicus Satellite Monitoring Service is to shame polluters. That's what it's designed for. For people like me to come along and say, hey, look at all these polluters. But when you look at the surface level, there's not enough carbon there. You know, any kind of surface level sequestration you're going to do is going to be almost meaningless because... This crab here, okay, you can step up to 850 hectopascals, so maybe up in the mountains and shit, yeah, maybe, you know. In China, I mean, they might as well, you know, do whatever they can do in China. This is 50 hectopascals again, 64,000 feet. That's what it looked like two years ago. This is what it looks like now. And... This, a weird, this legend is weird, but it goes from 418, right? It goes from 300 up to 418, and then it jumps up to 1,000. So it's, that's, a, that's a question. Um, but that's what it looks like now. And this is the reason why I started doing this, is because I saw this when I first heard about the Copernicus satellite. I'm saying, I'm like, wow, you know, because this is like, I'm like, you know, I really wanted something. I had been wanting to see something that where you could, where they had a visual display of what the ga gases look like. And damn, they they have it. That's how I saw this on somebody's channel. I'm like, shit, I got to look at that. I got to see what's going on. So I saw this, and I'm like, well, that yeah, looks, you know, that looks bad. Um, and then I, you know, went on about my business. Six months later, I made another video. Um, where it looked a lot, it, it wasn't this bad. It was it was pretty close to this, and I was like, "Damn, where did that come from?" So between February of between February first of 2019, and I think it was maybe fall of 2019 or the summer of of 2019. Uh, it went from that to this. And I was like, damn, what the hell happened? Well, you can see already there's the footprint. There's, it's, it's, it's methane. And when you look at the methane, so, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of step through to see where it's coming from. You know, which I, I think you can intuit. Now yeah, I could be wrong, but I think you can intuit that from from where you see the the, the buildup. This 300 hectopascals. It kind of sort of starts migrating towards 
a little bit lower down, 300 hectopascals is between that 64,000, probably about 40-ish thousand feet, somewhere in there. This is at, or uh, maybe it might be 30,000 feet, and I think it's about 30,000 feet, and 500 hectopascals is 18,000-ish feet. See how it kind of sort of coalesces towards the pole and away from the southern pole. So it sort of like paints a picture. Right? And then at the lower levels, 850 hectopascals, it's just totally, you know, surface level. Wow. You know, we're talking 300, you know, less than 400 parts per million in a lot of places. So, right. So that's methane. Okay, this is methane here. That was, that was carbon dioxide. So this is methane. And um, that's your total column. And so the total column, because I guess, I, I don't know how they work that, but it's, I guess it's intended to show you where it's coming from or how it's wafting up through the atmosphere. But uh, it's, I don't know, to me it seems misleading, but, you know, I'll leave that to the experts. Um, but this is the surface level. And one thing... You see how clean it is, how clear it is up here around Nova Scotia, uh, around uh, Norway, Sweden, the nexus of Norway, Sweden, Finland, right up here, right, northern Europe, and Russia. Of course, you know, you can see all these dots going across Russia. That's got to be from oil and gas infrastructure. And, of course, Britain and, and Europe, they got a lot of methane. This methane here is, again, from... Rice production. But here, look at this. So these big hashtags here, these big hash marks, that's every that's every midnight UTC, uh, universal time, which is Greenwich Mean Time. Right? So these each one of these hash marks is 24-hour intervals. See, you got Monday the 28th, Tuesday the 29th, Wednesday the 30th, and so forth. Right? Because this was... Had to be. I must have. I must have actually recorded this in January. So that would have been January 28th, January 29th, January 30th. But you can see that how that is, and it's pretty much the same time of year as it is now. That's persistent surface level. You can see how much methane is coming out from the, the surface February level. First. And now it's when persistent. You step up. You got to. I'm just going to go to 500. It's persistently. A lot more, a lot more coming off of Northern Europe, Russia, Sweden, Finland, Norway, and it's persistent. Right? In other words, it's not wafting and waning like, like typical, you know, like like you would normally for being able to see actually what's going on with Surface different level. gases uh, emanating from the earth. Monday, the 28th, so this is the 28th, methane forecast Monday. and I just want to show you this. I'm going to play this for a second. He's He has actually done this on his channel but I'm going to look at something a little bit different. You can see how it sort of moves around but that the, the methane is persistent in and Look Siberia. at the concentration, and that's and right in Europe there too. It's that's, that's interesting. I'm that's not right really sure. Part of that Sweden. might be coming from like, what the hell is agriculture. That? Certainly, is coming from there? agriculture. You know what's going on with that? You know, real dark right there. So, and I'm sure that the you know European Space Agency, the people over at uh, CAMS, can tell you more about it. You can also go. Uh, this is the global look. If you look at uh, the Arctic gives you an overhead view. Gonna let that play for a second. So, if this is to be believed, and you know, fuck, I don't know. You know what I mean? Um, could probably make a few few phone calls. I don't know if they're really gonna talk to me. But you know, the way I look at it is, if I put it out there, and nobody's picking it up. I've been talking about this for years now. I've been showing this shit for years. This should be front page news in the New York Times should be 
This should be front page news on the New York Times. You don't see it anywhere. Because that's the end of the discussion. It's the discussion is over. Bottom line. But notice that they must have been shamed out of doing because there is very little methane coming off of that. That it's actually Finland and uh, Sweden. This this nexus here where they the fingers, <laughs> you know, where the Norway, Sweden, Finland fingers meet up right above right above Mother Russia there. Um, <clears throat> not my mother, but, you know, I was going to say motherfucker Russia, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but they did something about it, right? Um, they cleaned it up. And that's what needs to happen around the world. And I think this might be some of the stuff that's going on with the farmers in India. You know, that somebody's seen this and they're like, oh, my God, you know, it's so embarrassing. That's what this, that's what, see, this, this is the Copernicus, the Copernicus satellite is doing what it's supposed to do. Some dude in Gainesville looked and said, and, you know, with, with, with Sweden, as much as they have their dick in their hand about global warming, you know, with, with Greta Thunberg and all that, you know, I don't, you know, you know. And to have that much methane wafting off of there, it doesn't look good. And they're like, oh, my God, I'm going to do something about that. That's so embarrassing. It's so embarrassing. Well, obviously, this because this is today. There's nothing coming off of there. And even over over this way, it, it it's so, it's, it's obviously has been dealt with. So maybe we can deal with some of these other things because this is where the, it's where the carbon's coming from. That's where it's coming from. That's ugly. Fifty hectopascals looking down from the top of the earth. Yeah. Look at that. So this also speaks of something else. Cold temperatures causes that because of the compressibility of carbon dioxide. You know, you're getting below the dew point. When you start getting into the negative 30, 40 degrees Celsius and shit and below, you're, you know, you're past the dew point and it, you know, it's going to come out. So that's what I'm hoping is that it's, there's that, that once there's a methane pulse, that it goes up into the stratosphere, causes mass global cooling and pulls all that stuff out of the air. You know, but that's provided that nobody's, you know, pushing a whole bunch back in. And, you know, it's been hot up there. You're talking about 100 degrees up in the up in the Arctic, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and then Siberia and stuff. That's just, like, unheard of. And then they have a bunch of fires and stuff, which is, as I said in the last video, you know, nuclear winter. I mean, that's from firestorms, from nuclear weapons. What's the difference between that and having a whole bunch of huge forest fires and stuff? You know, and these things could cycle back and forth. We could have super hot year and followed by a super cold year. Follow, you know what I mean? It could just be crazy for a while, which it it's crazy now. So, and that's really what we're talking about. That's the upshot of it. It's a complicated system. The Earth spins, you know, and so the days are short, twenty-four hours. You know, there's the Earth, you know, goes on kind of an elliptical orbit and the thing, you know, the procession of the poles and shit. And you know what I mean? So tidal things, two, two fluid system, air and water. And, you know, it's enormously complicated. And you can't just, you know, it's not going to be black and white. The Earth isn't just going to turn into all Venus or, you know, or all Neptune or whatever the fuck. You know, it's not going to do that. So, but it could be like, you know, really hard to adjust to because of the amount of change, and which is really what they're talking about. That's what, you know, that's why they started calling it climate change instead of global warming because global warming is kind of 
it's easy for people to dismiss and they're and they're doing it right now you know talking about how green energy is such a bad thing well it's not bad small nuclear is not bad business as usual may not really pan out um, I mean you know there's a big place how much do you really want to play with this yeah. so there it is you know I don't remember what I was going to say about you know this the entirety of this thing but there it is you know deal with it bioconsumption endotherms and ectotherms that's what I was talking about transport to depth this is chemistry of atmospheres um, by Richard P. Wayne this is where I you know this is the book that I that I read pretty much to get a, a grip on the nature of atmospheric chemistry um, it's not a big book it's a little it's a thin little book um, but there's a bunch of really key stuff in it um, and I think I read, I want to say I read the third edition, but it might have been the first edition because it was in 80, 1985. But this looks like the book. So it might have been a third edition. It's possible that it was a third edition. But I want to say it was a first edition. Nah, it might have been, I think it was because I think this is the book, the actual book that I read. And he's the guy, he's like the man, you know, Oxford Press, Richard P. Wayne. You know, that's him right there, Professor Wayne. So, you know, atmospheric chemistry is not trivial. Fluid dynamics, you know, um, statistical analysis of fluid systems like that, which I have some theoretical stuff on. I'm going to get to that later. I wanted to touch on the X Prize a little bit and just, you know, that's a tough nut to crack, bro. You know? Elon's got the way to, you know, I say stuff, you know, you know, he's got to rape the earth business. I'm sorry. And, and they've talked about it, how they, you know, they got to do some stuff to, you know, <clears throat> to, to, you know, to sustainably extract the materials that they get for the batteries, which the batteries use. Uh, they don't just use, they use a small amount of lithium, apparently, and a certain amount of uh, nickel and uh, graphite which are all that, you know, extracting, buying those materials from the rape the earth people is not really going to like, you know, be a problem for them. It's not really disruptive for them. And he's the richest man in the world now, and he's obviously trying to solve this problem. But, uh, you know, I'll tell you, it's a, it's a, I think it's a tougher nut to crack. I can't imagine. I, I, I got to imagine the guy is really busy doing a lot of stuff. Uh, I don't know if he's if he's really that aware of what's going on right now uh he may be almost certainly more aware than i am of a lot of shit for sure no doubt about it because you know it's elon musk um because he's all that in a bag of chips <laughs> just a, that's all you know he, he's the tiger woods of science <laughs> you know that's maybe that's the similarity um so it's a necessary step what he's doing is a necessary step so i don't want to shit on him you know what i mean I don't want to shit on Tether. It's an important. That's an important step, and and what he's done is is what he's accomplished in getting a car company in in making science and sustainable things like sustainable transportation. Making that cool is fucking monumental and cannot be understated. And I don't really want to, you know, I don't want to shit on what he's doing by saying that, you know, basically. It's you're chaining one rape the earth fucking paradigm for another, and I'm, he's aware of that. And they're doing and they're and they're taking steps and they're doing you know appropriate things about that. So I try you know bottom line is I trust Elon. Maybe I, I you know I don't even know if I should or not, but you know because I don't know the man, I don't fucking know the guy, but you know when you see somebody shedding tears on television about the situation that they had in Australia. Where they had storms that knocked out the the power grid, and somebody had to come in there, and, and he came in there with Tesla batteries and basically solved their problem, um, and and shed a tear over it. 
uh, and I did a video about that. Elon wept. Um, that's powerful. You know, so more power to him. And he's, you know, look, I'm not going to say that it's not doable. A gigaton, you know, that's a billion tons. And you just saw how much, you know, hundreds of billions of tons, uh, you know, $75 billion a year that Australia, and they're just not, I'm sorry, they're just not going to stop taking, they're just not going to stop doing $75 billion in business a year for anything, unless the shit really, really, really hits the fan. So, there it is. Um, but, you know, more power to them. And um, kind of the reason that I'm bringing up the uh, methanolamine, is that how you pronounce that? I can't, you know. Mono, monoethanolamine, M-E-A, monoethanolamine. It's with the stuff they use in uh, submarines. This is the first thing that jumped into my mind. Hey, why don't they just skeet a bunch of methanolamine, monoethanolamine, up in the strat, but in particular, not on the 500 hectopascal level, because I don't think it's really necessary there because of the weather, but up in the 50 hectopascal level where it's dry, you know, something like that to mitigate that. But, you know, that's a wait and see kind of thing. It may not be necessary to do that. We may be going through a cooling phase. You know, it's like you may not really want to fuck with that. And by the way, you know, what does monoethanolamine do in the environment? I mean, I know it's a, it's a long way up there. By the time it reaches the surface, you know. But that was my first thought. And so the discussion is maybe we should... Because somebody else has got to have that. I, somebody else is using monoethanolamine. There's a couple of companies that are using that for carbon sequestration in a machine to, you know, to remove the carbon dioxide from the air and process it out so back into a gas and store it. So it's contained. It's actually they they're actually they're actually bubbling the air through a contained volume where I'm talking about just spraying it out into the stratosphere off from an aircraft. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because I'm like, if I thought of it, somebody else probably thought of it. So I need to, like, chime in and say, yeah, that's cool. It's an idea, but it might not be wise. And we might want to let the situation develop. <laughs> Um, a lot of research has to be done about, you know, what's the shit like in the environment? What's the breakdown? And You know what I mean? And what does that do? What are the knock-on effects? Because the other thing, too, is like in that same spot, monoethanolamine, what does that do to ozone? You know, is that going to pull out the ozone layer? What's left of it and shit? Um, you know, it's, it has to be studied, you know, thoroughly. And I don't think anybody, I don't think it's really time for any sort of knee-jerk kind of stuff. Um, but what the, what the people who are, or who are naysayers on the climate change thing, on the global warming thing, and on the sustainability thing, what they need to see is that this shit is really going on. And, um, and, and the, the, the problem is in its, it's not. It's hard to predict how this is gonna how this is gonna go down because not that many people really understand the physics and chemistry of the atmosphere. You know, but yeah, there it is, and and that is not right around the North Pole. Not a whole lot of methane up there. That's because it's all it's all been transformed. It's all reacted with ozone. And that's all I got. I love you guys, man. It's, you know, my name is Arn Crosby Lyles. Don't panic. You know what I mean? Uh, some people out there are probably like liable to panic about shit. Don't panic. Just let the situation develop. It's going to be okay. It's going to, you know, I mean, you know, it's, we're going to figure it out. Um, it's a call to action. He's right. This is true. 
We want teams to build real systems that can make a measurable impact at a gigaton level, whatever it takes. Time is of the essence. He's not bullshitting. Elon is not bullshitting. Time is of the essence. So. God bless him and Godspeed, you know. And f please forgive all that Rape the Earth commentary about his business, but, uh, you know, that's the way some people see it. And, uh, you know, it's a big, it's a huge business. My, my point with the whole coal thing and stuff, it's just such a huge business, you know. To change that paradigm is enormously difficult, and he has done, Elon Musk has done, like, a Herculean amount of stuff to bring us, you know, to the other side. And, uh, but I'm just like, you know, small nuclear, you know, that's, I'm mean, obviously. Solar panels aren't going to cut the mustard. I'm sorry. That's, I, 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 that's where I break with the, with the thing, you know, batteries are good, but batteries ain't going to solve the whole, um, uh, the whole deal. <coughs> But they got some, you know, apparently some pretty impressive battery technology out there. And that actually does do quite a bit. That does a lot of head. Batteries, that does a lot of heavy lifting. It does a lot of heavy lifting. So he's done he's done that Herculean amount of, of heavy lifting on that. And, you know, what can you say? You know, thank you. Um... And that's it. My name is R. Crosby Lyles. You all take it easy and Godspeed, you know. Um, time is of the essence. That's it.